So welcome everybody to White Pines Virtual Annual Meeting Chapter 2, our second week of um, a, a program, uh, a Zoom program for you. Um, and today's program is the ABCs of Q&A, Thinking Like a Journalist to Tell Your Community Story. Very, very lucky to have Jeff Milo here from the Ferndale um, Library. I had seen Jeff at uh, Small Libraries Big Impact, which was maybe a year and a half ago now, up in Gaylord. Um, yeah, last April of last year. Yeah, um, and obviously that couldn't happen this year or maybe it won't happen next year, I don't know, but this is sec the second best way to do things. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about Jeff. Um, his Facebook page, yes, I stopped you on Facebook. Um, says he's a musical journalist, a freelance writer, and a public library proponent. He's been working in libraries since he was a teenager. His degree is in journalism from the MSU School of Communication and Media. And for the last 16 years, he's been a reporter at large for several publications, including the Detroit Free Press, Paste Magazine, the Ann Arbor Current, Real Detroit Weekly, and the Detroit Metro Times. Since 2010, he's been a circulation specialist for the Ferndale Area District Library, where his responsibilities have expanded into social media content production, program coordinating, including live music, and leading the library's art and exhibition committee. At the end of 2019, he started hosting and producing, producing episodes for the library's new podcast called A Little Too Quiet. And I know I've sent that link a couple times in the updates that I do weekly, and um, they're just really, they're great. The last one um, about the spooky or the scary books was, was a fun one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jeff's going to talk to us a little bit about some tips and tricks uh, of the interview process, and um, I will turn it over to Jeff. Terrific. Well, he hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's great to see everyone. And I am going to, uh, I should, uh, I should say I'm no longer a circulation specialist. They oh. officially made me the marketing coordinator here. So that's very exciting. All right. It was kind of already what I was doing. And about 30% of this presentation, everyone can hear me okay? Oh, here's a new audience member. I'm not gonna begin till G4 gets in here. Excellent. So 30% of this program, I'm gonna be very much giving of myself and my process and how I've been using my journalist brain in um, the capacities of working in a library, particularly in the realm of social media or program promotion. And then I'm gonna get into the nuts and bolts of conducting a really great interview and how you can actually do that at your library. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to my slides if that's cool and then I'll just narrate us through, is that okay? Great. Hopefully this works. Can everyone see what I see? Okay, great. All right. So thinking like a journalist in a library setting, which uh, since, I mean, I've been working in libraries for since the late 90s, so on and off as a part-timer. So really since 2006, I have been inside of a library setting thinking like a journalist. But with the podcast that we started and with several other instances, whether it was hosting a program where we have a presenter and maybe you want to do some moderated Q&A with them, or if you're doing a blog and you want to interview someone in your community, you know, you're going to be able to hopefully apply some of the tips that I'm going to share with you. But as I said, the first few slides are going to be kind of just some of the pros of how thinking like a journalist has benefited me in the uh, library setting. Hopefully this slide works. Wait one second, everybody. Let me move you over there. Okay, can everybody see that? New slide, great. So um, we've had to really, of course, up our game in terms of how we uh, engage with our patrons and our community, uh, especially in terms of social media. And uh, what we're primarily utilizing those platforms for are self-promotion. We're promoting the library and uh, how awesome we are. Not that self-promotion has to be a dirty word, 
But as you'll see down the side of the right, we can create compelling content that crafts a narrative or at least summarizes a narrative. And we can focus on these other areas that feel like they're part of a bigger story. So, I mean, I remember when I got here, first day on the job, I was asked, do I feel like starting a blog? And I remember thinking, why would a library need a blog? And that sounds like such a novel idea in 2010, but of course we did. And within the next year, we had tumbled into Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest. So there's all these areas where we are creating content. And if we're thinking like a journalist, it means we're more careful about how we craft that communication because often it involves either us as a talking head, maybe in a video, or us as an interviewer in a podcast, or us as an interviewer in a blog, or we're crafting the blog. So there's all these words that we have to jumble around, or it could just be a social media caption. But when you think about other outlets you can cover, you could document your own library's history. You could do staff profiles, which are really fun for a blog or a website. You could cover local history. You could feature local authors, local musicians, local artists. Um, so the library's web presence can become a platform for presenting narratives and interviews all about these topics. Okay. When uh, I started working more and more on social media at the library, I started thinking of the outlets in which journalistic brevity and brio can be of assistance and brevity and brio are fancy ways of saying concise writing and writing with energy and your writing can be on the library's blog it can be just on your social media captions you can generate your own press releases or you can make an informative event description on your facebook page but it can also be storytelling. If you do find an outlet similar to a podcast, you can craft a narrative for your library and your community, which is particularly something we tried to do in the first season of the podcast quite often. We had folks from the Friends of the Library group come on. We had librarians come on. We had stories about our library's history. But you can be interviewing for your blog or your YouTube channel, or you can try out something like IGTV, which is very fun and potentially a podcast. This can all require strong interviewing skills. So um, this is my page to just give a bit of a preachy bit of tips to folks who are creating captions for Facebook posts or just brief descriptions for your event pages or even short press releases to promote events and resources. Try to craft our written communique as a library as though you are reporters and you want to pack in the most pertinent information first and foremost because we are finding ourselves creating content all the time especially since our this will be a running theme since our patrons really can't come into the building and we can't have face-to-face -face interactions we're relying more and more on communicating to them through our website posts or our social media posts everywhere we're posting content. So whether it's describing a virtual event or describing a YouTube video, we wanna be as concise as possible, but uh, yeah, just look at all these outlets to the right and where we are required to write, just food for thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, another quick slide about benefits of journalistic standards. You will get a lot of flack if your library has typos anywhere, really, especially in its Facebook captions uh, or typos on its blog. Not that I would ever um, stereotype librarians, but library staff are presumed to be well-read and very erudite and very sharp on their grammar and vocabulary. So we, we don't really get a pass there. Make sure that it's always good if you make sure that at least one other staff staffer is uh, taking a look at, at your blog post, what you're writing, maybe even uh, show a video that you made to another staffer before sending it out there. There's always time to proofread. So grammatical eloquence is a discipline unto itself. Um, 
And then I think this is just beneficial. My brain has gotten to the point where it just thinks in calendar dates, the same way a newspaper has to has to make reports seven days a week. We need to figure out when we want to premiere something that we've worked on, when we want to start promoting a program that's coming up, a virtual program. And we also need to leave ourselves time to edit and write whatever else is required to promote that. So the last thing we want to do is share something about an event when it's only two days away. So deadlines can help us be ready, be ready for that kind of stuff. And another thing to be mindful of is if we create a video or we're working on a blog about local history or anything along those lines, we have to allow for that time away from our normal work duties to work on these fun, engaging writing things. So giving ourselves deadlines is just good time management to balance it against staffing the reference desk or tending to circulation when you are. Deadlines are gonna help you there. Okay, down the left, when I say time management, that's already basically, I think that's already basically there in the strengths of any library worker. Library staff are, I think, naturally detail-oriented as well. So what can we do when we think like a journalist is shift those strengths into organizing our communication and boosting those communication skills. A journalist is constantly thinking about what their readers are thinking. What do their readers want to know? So we can consider that even when we're dreaming up what kinds of programs they might be interested in as a starter, but that enters into mind reading territory, doesn't it? When we're in the middle of an interview, which I want to get into in just a minute, we are actually thinking on our feet, even when we're sitting down. There are a few scenarios in which you, a librarian, a library tech, library staff, or program coordinator could take on the role of interviewer. So before we do that, though, a few more quick notes on social media, because more than anything, as I said, in a post-pandemic world, your social media channels are where people are finding out about your library. So it becomes the voice for your library, since sadly those face-to-face -face chats at the service desks just aren't, aren't happening in the same way that they might. So, and they're not seeing flyers posted as they might physical printed out flyers. So social media, consider it as really a voice. So of course, while we're being concise and having brevity and brio, we can also inject our voices into those posts and even adopt a conversational tone for engagement. Um, conversational tones, our signature voice, you know, uh, we were talking earlier about that Scary Books podcast we made. That's all just our personalities right there on the podcast. So as I'm saying, you know, think like a journalist and be concise and cold and reporting things, it's never a bad thing to let your personality shine. But, and then here at the attention grabbing factor, journalists go for attention grabbing headlines. It doesn't hurt to have a bit of sensationalism uh, when we are trying to communicate the awesomeness of our library. So tap into, try to tap into what you think your patrons will find most worthwhile and accentuate that. But of course, remember that Attention spans are, you know, fleeting these days. So that conciseness factor does come back into play. Okay. So along the side, just a quick riff on press releases. If you guys haven't tried them yet, they are, don't be afraid of them. They're very easy, I think. Um, I can say from experience that it's worth it to craft your own press release to send out to your local newspapers and reporters because it is very likely that they will be interested in doing a feature on you. The newspaper has to put something out seven days a week. They're always looking for stories. And uh, a library is a great human interest story. And if you're giving them a press release, it makes it that much easier for them and that much tantalizing for them to get something in for you because you're kind of doing some of the work for them. You're providing a lot of information for them 
They might even just copy and paste what you already provided them. And I can answer any questions about press releases at the end, but you can also recycle some of the stuff that you've put into your press release for social media captions, which is particularly good if you want to describe a program. To the right, this is the news story structure. Any typical front page newspaper story will follow this formula, and it matches up with how you would construct a press release. If you're talking about a program, or if you're just talking about a new resource, or if you're talking about something the youth librarians were up to, your first paragraph or so, you want to put the most important aspects first. That's the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, and also how. How might not be applicable. The next paragraph fleshes out the details of what you're announcing. And the final paragraph, just useful tidbits and extra background. I said uh, human interest stories. Uh, when you're thinking of a program to host, or a video to make, or if you want to try an IGTV interview, a blog interview maybe, or if you want to do something like a podcast, think like a newspaper and ask yourself what the human interest story is here. And now, human interest story, that's what we consider something that isn't hard news, like not the crime beat or not politics. Uh, that's, that's where libraries fit. And it could be a, a local organization that you can partner with, a local business maybe. It can be a local artist that you can showcase and interview. It could be an author talk. It could be tidbits about your city's local history, as I've said, potentially from longtime residents or local historical society members. You can also look into StoryCorps, which I can talk about in Q&A if you want. It's a story sharing interview series that's archived in the Library of Congress. And some of you may or may not have heard of it through NPR. It's something that libraries can try in which they facilitate and moderate interviews in their community. But yeah, human interests are what the newspapers would call stories where people are at the heart of the story, which is great. So. Up to the left, cliche about library staff. People presume librarians are shy or reserved, but when we are interviewing people, we have to engage our inner extrovert. But it is easier on yourself if you don't think about it as an interview and rather as a conversation. When you're thinking like an interview, interviewer rather, thinking like a journalist and thinking like an interviewer, here are some of my main bullet points. Don't just know your questions, but put the thought into why you want to know the answer to this question. Make sure you are asking what feels like an important question to you. Writing out your questions and making sure that they have a flow is very important. You could prepare 10 questions and obviously you're just writing them down without your interview subject in front of you. So in a weird way, you have to anticipate what their answer may or may not be. And this is a tricky skill to develop, but you just have to be determinate on, does the second question feel like it would naturally follow the first? Does the third feel like it naturally follows the second? Uh, it's almost like you're play acting the conversation in your head ahead of time. Flow is important to the questions. You don't want to throw your subject off. So natural follow-ups. Uh, the third one, you will probably ask uh, snappier questions for a blog so that you can have a more concise answer. But you might ask more open-ended and heavily conversational questions if you're doing something like a podcast, which is a lot more relaxed. And then when the interview is happening, listen closely. This is the trick. You, you can't really just fixate on what your next question is going to be in the midst of listening to their answer. You know, you ask question one, they start talking. You can't just say, oh, okay, I have to get ready for question two. It's, a, it's great to listen to what they're saying because you should allow for the improvisational follow-up that you actually didn't have written down to kind of naturally come from your mind. And you can get to that next pre-written question later, it's fine. A few more bullet points if your guest is a specialist in a certain area, 
write out a question that allows them to really shine on that, uh, give them that platform. If they run a gallery, ask about that. If they are an author, ask about their process. If they are a professor, what's their area of expertise? Um, it's okay to challenge them a little bit. You can uh, carefully challenge them with some tougher questions. You can, I like to say that I will, at least for 30% of the interview, be playing devil's advocate and ask them something that might be taking a preposterous or nonsensical view of something. I'll be, we'll be in the middle of a conversation on a certain subject and I'll just go devil's advocate. Well, what about this angle? But if it's good to get it in their words, get them to respond to whatever preposterous devil's advocate question you have. Because that usually generates a great quote from them. And then it's always a good idea to take notes as the interview is happening, if you can, but like super brief, super concise notes. Uh, like they'll be may maybe saying something, just give a little note to yourself saying, oh yeah, use this quote, done. Or uh, if they're in the middle of a long three paragraph rambling answer, write down, ask about this at the end, if they're really in the heat of it. Just quick little things to yourself and it will help you pick out what you want to use later, or it will help you with your follow-ups at the end. Don't be afraid of silences. If your subject goes silent, they could be very well thinking of something else to say. Or if you stay silent, they'll feel that they really need to keep talking. And it's interesting to see what they might say next. So. Don't be afraid to sit on those silences every once in a while. Going back to that, when the interview feels like it's winding down, sort of ask yourself in the back of your head, did I get what I wanted? Did I, did I really get to know this person? Did, I, did they really answer those first three questions correctly? Not correctly, but fulfillingly. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just give one follow-up question. Hey, these are the four ideal areas to cover for almost any interview. The first one is you have to kind of open up and explore what's significant about this person. Uh, what's special about their story? What do they do? And then you move over to two, journey, journey and development. What's their, what's their origin story? How do they get to where they are? Why are they a librarian, for example? Why are they an artist? Uh, why are they where they're at? What drew them to it? And then who have been their influences in their life? What are some quotes that they live by? You know, did their parents have a big influence? Did they have mentors? What were some of their formative experiences? You know, moments where they realized what they wanted to do with their lives. Sometimes there's a great anecdote in there that can lead to some excellent, excellent stories and quotes. And then what is it that they find most fulfilling? What are some of their big achievements? Whatever their hobby or craft or their elected official or whatever they do, what is it that keeps them doing that? What is the fulfillment there? <laughs> okay, and then here's our just some more ways and means of interviewing in a library setting and then how to do it. If you are doing it for a blog, I have that you could meet a subject and use maybe a handheld digital recorder, which are pretty affordable, but could be trickier in a, in a COVID climate, unless you wanna interview them through their mask, which is fine. You should be able to still record it. You can also do a phone interview with a handheld digital recorder because a lot of them will come with a phone jack and then you could just put the microphone between your ear and the receiver. Pretty cool. Um, nothing wrong with doing a, an interview entirely over email. I know plenty of journalists who've done it. On occasion, I do it, and I often do it with musicians because musicians just feel more naturally articulate when they are allowed to write as opposed to sort of speaking on the fly. So that's 
that's a feasible way to do an interview over a blog. If you're doing it for a podcast, you could meet someone and record the Zoom meeting. And then Zoom will give you the audio of that. You kind of technically have a podcast at that point. You can also use a handheld digital recorder and you can take the audio that's captured on that recorder and maybe throw it into some editing software like Adobe Audition and spruce it up a little bit and make any edits if you'd like. You can also use an app on your phone, uh, which will also capture audio. Or there are these really cool USB mics. They're very nice microphones that will just USB cable into your laptop or desktop. And that will just actually just create a better sound quality for you. And then for a video, you could do a video interview if you have a great digital SLR camera, or you could just use your phone. Or again, you can have a video interview where you're just recording Zoom. There's plenty of possibilities. But you're going to need to do some editing, and that's where, you know, uh, a few things to remember here. Just a little checklist. Again, extra set of eyes on whatever you're creating before publishing or sharing your interview. Test whether it's coherent and compelling by having other staff members look at it or read it first. Uh, remember that the interview process is not the story. If you are doing a blog and sometimes if you're doing a podcast, you can be a little ruthless when it comes to appraising which portions of your entire conversation will be the actual thing that you share with your patrons. Um, you know, usually if I'm doing a 40 minute interview and there's like six pages of transcribed notes of quotes. I might only make like a one page or two page little article about it. So, but you just have to go through the notes and realize what was the story really? What's the most interesting part? Because you have to gauge attention spans. So you're cutting out the excess, the redundancy or the encumbering details. And this is just a fun quote from Zadie Smith. The secret to editing your work is simple. You need to become its reader instead of its writer. So make sure that you are as engaged by what you've created, uh, but try to kind of step outside of yourself and say, would anyone else be engaged by this? Here are just some outlets to the left. Uh, blogs are usually hosted on WordPress, but you can also do Squarespace and several. There's a couple other actually great sites for hosting blogs. You could go to YouTube. I mean, I know, I know our YouTube activity has certainly increased as we've done more virtual programming. Uh, IGTV is interesting. You can almost like Zoom invite people on and split screen with them, which is really cool. A lot of musicians have been doing that actually lately. They've been creating their own web series and doing interviews, which is great. Uh, Facebook, Facebook Live, of course, and then StoryCorps is something we were going to really get into before quarantine. We were going to use our podcast uh, hardware and our mixer to invite community members in. And the sort of the scenario that's there is usually family members, a pair of them will come in and one family member will interview the other family member and the audio is just preserved and they just get to, to get to capture their story. And it's really beautiful, but Hopefully we'll be doing that when scenarios are a little, a little safer. So back to the idea of self-promotion. Libraries, I mean, they, they aren't selling anything. We're active on social media. We have a page, just like any other small business. We appear as though we're a small business if you look at our activity on the internet. But our primary purpose is to engage our community with culturally enriching content. So that is an exciting thing to want to promote. So I don't know, just don't lose sight of that, of course. I'm preaching to the choir. Storytelling is virtual programming. So normally we might have an in-person presentation. We might have a professor doing a lecture. We might have an author here for a book signing or whatever, but your interview, however you're presenting it, blog or podcast or however, it substitutes for that, that missed connection. So remember the value there. And then refocus on the local, emphasize the importance of 
local history in terms of an idea for content to create or the achievements and efforts of dynamic residents and local organizations. Those are stories that are waiting to be told and your local newspaper might be too tied up trying to cover world events to, to cover it. So that's what we tried to do on our podcast. And then just some key questions for almost any interview. Uh, and I think I should share this, I'll share these slides with you guys so that you can have this. Um, this will work for almost anybody to get a good conversation going. Ask them about vivid memories. Ask them about those formative experiences. I literally ask anybody that, whether you're uh, someone on city council or, or uh, a firefighter or a librarian, just tell me about that. Who has been a profound influence upon your life? That's a conversation starter. And then what do you find most fulfilling about your job or your art or your, if you're a nonprofit, whatever you're committing your life to, what is fulfilling about it? What do you find fulfilling? And what are some aspects uh, about this thing that they specialize in that you think go unnoticed? So a, a classic thing would be, you know, when we're writing our blog and we have our staff profiles, whether we're talking to a page or a circulation specialist or a librarian, we're always asking them, what do you think is the most common misconception about your job. And that's always a fun conversation to have on our blogs. And then what keeps you motivated? What is that thing in your heart that is really fuel for, for your whole inspirational engine? Always great questions for any, any interview. Um, and then back to that whole letting list, like letting silence is happening or just being a good listener it's not a passive exercise. Uh, when you are inter interviewing someone on Zoom, it's especially important that your, your voice and your face and your eyes and your body language, all of this all plays a part in engaging your interview subject. Uh, so if you think of all the classic interviewers, you can see how, I mean, obviously they're on television and they have to look very engaged, but it's very important. They lean in, they're like, hmm, tell me more. You don't say, these are, oh really, these are just things that keep your, they keep your talker talking and they work. And again, back to that improvisational follow-up that comes to you, that isn't written down, that just happens magically in the, in the midst of the conversation. Sometimes that question is the best one, even if you didn't write it down. And I believe I'm out of slides. That's it, everybody. Well, it was really great, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, and I put in the chat, if anybody had questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can just unmute and um, ask Jeff yourself. That would be fine too. Well, here, hearing none, I have some. So. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so as you as we're, you were going through your slides, I did wonder, can we have your slides? So oh yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so when you are interviewing somebody, do you do you try to do some warm up questions with them at first to get them comfortable, or to make sure your audio is working, or just to get a cadence for the interview? Tell me your process. Yes to every single one of those, Kate. <laughs> Breaking the ice is so important. You, I mean, in a safer world, maybe you'll meet someone at a coffee shop or maybe they'll come directly into your library and sit face to face, but they, doesn't matter who they are. Like if you're gonna be having authors at your conference, doesn't matter how famous you are or how many interviews you do, every human being is nervous for every interview. Uh, you yourself as the interviewer may be nervous, but take into account that they are also nervous. So at least the first three to four minutes are casual chit chat. And it might not be profound. It might be the weather, but uh, human beings just have to sort of attain a sense of comfort with each other. Even if we're just saying, oh, can you believe the traffic or what, or what have you, or, or uh, how are you doing uh, during quarantine? Oh, my house is a mess. And just this, whatever, it's not 
pertinent to what they are actually there to talk about. It's so important. Now, when we're doing a podcast, we always do a sound check first. And there's no way that that's not awkward to, to do if you had an interviewer, an interviewee sitting in front of you and you're saying, all right, just, um, all right, we're going to try and record just 10 seconds. And then you have to listen back. And they're just sort of sitting there for a minute. That's inevitably awkward, but it is important to make sure that you're actually being able to capture what you're, what you're doing here. And same goes with the handheld recorder. I would like to maybe get about 15 seconds and then just quickly play it back to myself, make sure the technology is working. Maybe the batteries are charged. So those are all super important. And obviously the first three minutes, first six minutes of your meetup, all that stuff is net is, is very important and probably a little awkward, but you'll both hopefully get comfortable. I think that um, reminding people that everybody is a little nervous. Oh yeah. And that's I, oh, yes. human nature, I guess. I can name so. names. <laughs> um, what, what has been your favorite interview that you've ever done? I can't tell you. I can't. <laughs> Uh, I have done, and this is going to sound like an exaggeration, but I have done nearly two interviews per week, oh. every month, for 16 straight years on holidays, too. So I've completely lost track. I could have prepared for that question, but... Uh, but I think I'll just say in general that I, and, and maybe this will just inspire people here, is that it's always refreshing, like like Amy Heimerl, it's always refreshing to just talk to an author or an artist or a musician because they are thinkers and they are thinking about the world and they have super interesting things to say. And the way that they look at the world is very interesting. And just to find out why they do what they do it's very fascinating to me. So that's why I primarily interview artists. Because uh, it's fun. I, I saw some questions in the chat. Maybe we should get to those too. Sure. Um, well, Stephanie says, what can we do to steal you away? I need someone <laughs> like you for our district. <laughs> How would we develop a position like yours? That's a great question. Mine happened organically. I just you know, I was asked to create the Facebook page. So, I mean, all the librarians were just naturally busy doing so many other things that I just started. Well, I, I'll tell you this, is that the, the director has always told me that, you know, we saw social media and everything that is involved with marketing as a way to tell our story. So I think just setting aside, even if you're a librarian and you're on the reference desk and you have all these other things just setting aside probably a half hour to an hour a day and thinking about this content generation of fun things to post on your social media uh, is is worth it I think it's it's not going to eat up too much of your day as you go back to that time management but if there's anyone on your staff usually when it comes to our library here it has been folks who are in the circulation staff usually just start wearing new hats and especially in a scenario where they don't have to be staffing the circulation desk they've been able to do more creative things so we've just been engaging those other folks on our staff we've been engaging a circulation staffer to think up uh, virtual book displays and they think up the themes for it on their own and it's just activating their creative side so they just start wearing that hat and that's sort of what happened to me i just started fashioning this hat that i found so it just kind of happens organically sometimes uh stephanie yeah um aaron asks if you don't reside in your community what is your best place to find local musicians artists etc Normally it, so if you're, you live outside the city and, and you want to tap into that, normally it would be 
you know, making a trip into the city on a Friday or Saturday and stopping at the local music venue. <laughs> but if you probably did a search on social media and you matched up even just something as simple as the city's name and music, you're probably going to get a result of pages that involve that band's Facebook page because 90% of bands at any level, local level or whatever, also have their own Facebook page. You can also go to a website like Bandcamp, which is where independent musicians are posting their albums all the time and do a search again with, uh, you, you could even just do a search of your city and Bandcamp will filter local bands from that city that have been posting their albums. Great, thank you. Um, Mimi wonders, can you track how many people listen to your podcast? Yeah, so um, Kate, I think I'm gonna send you this link. We use something called, and I, if, you've, if anyone here has been to a library conference where you've seen another library do a presentation on, po on podcasts, they probably have said that they use a hosting platform called Podbean. And I'll share the link with okay. Kate. Podbean, which is easy to remember though, if you just wanted to Google it right now, is really intuitive and they kind of do everything for you. Uh, it's a paid membership, it's fairly affordable. It's 20 bucks a year maybe, but they'll, you'll, up, you'll upload the audio of your podcast to Podbean and Podbean will shoot it out to Spotify and iTunes and everyone, Stitcher, et cetera, so that folks can listen to your podcast. And then Podbean has, uh, a stats tab and you can just open that and it will show you how many downloads each episode has gotten, uh, how they're listening to it. Are they listening to it from Spotify, from iTunes, where they're finding it and even what country they're listening to it in. I think we've had some Australian downloads. So Podbean will do everything for you. Is there a fee for that? Yeah, it's about 20 bucks a year. Oh, oh gosh, that's... It's pretty cheap. Very affordable. I could be wrong there. Okay. I still feel like it's. I still feel like it's affordable, though. Okay. So, um, that's great information. Thank you. Um, Christian wonders: Are there pitfalls that are easy to fall into that we should avoid? Well, one pitfall is, and it depend. It depends on how your conversation goes, but. One pitfall that comes to the top of my head is that. Depending on the story that your interview subject has to share, if it is something very personal and potentially even very intensely like a sad story for them to bring up, uh, be, be very careful uh, how you are conducting yourself because you are, you are almost entering psychiatrist territory at that point. And the last thing you want to say to anyone who has opened their heart to you about something tragic that has happened to them is, I know exactly how you feel. And it is a, it, sometimes you might not control it. Sometimes you might not, not even want to say it. Sometimes our brain just wants to say that because it's a very easy way of expressing empathy, but it can be, uh, very hurtful or infuriating to that person because it is their experience. So you have to be careful where that conversation goes sometimes. And if they have that story, let them tell it. Your empathy can be shown on your face. Um, but that that's a pitfall, you know, and that can make the conversation get awkward very, very quickly. So uh, don't be so impulsive to as to what you might say. Again, it goes back to those silences. Kind of let them work it out because they want to share it. So don't screw it up. Let them share it. That's um, the biggest pitfall. Other than that, just try to think of it like a conversation. Thank you. I do have a question about, um, are there any like legal implications of collecting and sharing personal narratives? I mean, do you need to have them sign something saying, you know, if the library were to keep um, 
you know, these, these personal recordings or? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I mean, just for, uh, but specifically only for StoryCorps. For, so when we were getting ready for StoryCorps, we already have a Google Doc shared of a contract that covers exactly those bases that you're talking about. But for something like a podcast, they're sort of voluntarily saying, like Amy Heimerall was like, of course I'll be on your podcast. And it's when you are inviting them by, usually by email, you're saying, would you like to be on our podcast and make them aware this is a podcast that is shared on Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, and it's shared on our website. Uh, they read all that and they're like, they'll write you back and say, sure, sign me up. I'll be on your, your podcast. It's very casual and formal agreement. But if it's something that the library wants to archive, then you might want to talk to your library director or the library director might want to talk to the lawyer that works with your library, but it's not too intense of a contract, but it does involve a quick contract just so that there are signatures on pieces of paper. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about StoryCorps. I mean, I know it was started in early 2000s um, through the Library of Congress, and I, um, I know it's, it's gone around the country, um, yeah. definitely being promoted a lot through NPR. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about maybe what you guys were going to do with, with that, that program? Yeah, so you can partner with StoryCorps and actually get their help. But there is, in some capacity, there's a charge for it. Um, that costs money. Now it's very awesome and you get their brand and you get their help. Uh, but it, there's, you'd have to pay for it. But in, you can contact StoryCorps directly and be super upfront with them and say, we're a library and we want to, we want to adapt the StoryCorps model. Um, cause StoryCorps is very transparent if you go to their website, they'll tell you how to do everything. And you can kind of copy that. We actually emailed StoryCorps and we were like, we, hey, and this is literally how it was. We we're like, hey, we, we kind of want to copy you. And they wrote us back and said, you know, that that's of course fine. You can't, they're just kind of a little pickier about, you know, not promoting it as StoryCorps, you know, promoting it as a Ferndale Library community stories sort of thing. But uh, what we were going to do is we were going to have a, a physical, this was back in August, a physical in-person in program. And we were going to have the audience come in and we were going to say, hey, folks, we're going to do something like StoryCorps. Do you want to sign up and tell your story? Uh, and again, we were in contact with StoryCorps and they were very cool with that. But you can also get their help. But it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, you can still send them the stories you capture, even if you don't partner with them and pay, you can still have that option to send them stories and they'll still archive it at the Library of Congress. If your participants in your community are cool with that, which brings back the contract. Okay. Hmm. I know in the, um, the community where I was a uh, worked at the library, um, in the probably in the 90s, I'm thinking, the director before me had done um, video chats kind of with um, all the, the past living postmasters in our community, small rural community, um, you know, retired teachers and, you know, just, just them talking about what it was like then and, and how, um, you know, things have changed or, you know, and it, and you can tell in these, they were on, you know, VHS tapes and you can tell that they were, um, that it, it was awkward at first. They felt they didn't want to be recorded and, you know, it wasn't just audio, it was a video. And, mm -hmm. and yet as the interviews progressed, I mean, they wound up just kind of sitting around just like they were at a table having coffee and it, it really just progressed in a real natural way. And so maybe if you don't want to just interview one person, maybe you get a group of people that have a common thread um, and, and that would help the conversation too. And uh, Absolutely. We've had panel discussions. We had one 
on information literacy where we had journalists and professors and librarians and even high school students around a big table. We had about six folks and those first 10 minutes are awkward. And then 30 minutes in, everyone's really opening up. Yeah. Really a nice thing to, yeah. to do for your community, for sure. Yeah. And then to have that, um, that history, that local mm -hmm. history as well. Absolutely. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, I do uh, want Jeff to give me two numbers from 1 to 22. And if you were in our call last week, you know that uh, those two people got gift cards. So Jeff, go ahead. Okay. Well, my lucky number is 13. Ah! And then the okay. second number I'll pick is 19. And 19. All right. So Vicki, a $25 Amazon gift card for Miss Vicki. Let me write that Hi, down Vicky. so I don't put it in my own pocket. Just a minute. And then Jennifer, a $25 Target gift card for you. Awesome. So Jeff, thanks so much. Thank um, you. It was great to have you here. And um, you know, I had seen you, like I said, at that one conference, and then when you started with your podcast, I started listening to that, and it's just, um, it's just, it's, you're, you're really easygoing, laid back, and I think that's a, a great part of um, the attraction to your interview style, too, so um, I suggest everybody try to click into the A Little Too Quiet podcast and um, enjoy some of the interviews that that Jeff has done. So that's, that's summation, Kate. Just be easy going. Yeah, yeah. But again, we're all nervous inside, Jeff. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much again. I appreciate your time and we'll let you go. And if you folks want to stay on, I have some more giveaways that we're gonna do. Um and there we go. Thanks, Jeff. Very well, everybody. Okay. Well. I thought that was really interesting. Jeff is a real, um, again, laid back kind of guy. Just, he doesn't seem to be, anything gets him upset or rankled or anything. I mean, you should listen to his podcast. They're very good. Um, okay, so I've got some questions. And if you were with us last week, you know that um, I'm going to ask you to put your comments in the chat or your, your answers to the questions in the chat. That way I know the first person who responds correctly. And also, if you were on the call last week, you know that, um, I don't know, second question, third question, my computer completely froze. So um, I had to run to shield this computer, but you know, technology is wonderful and we do have to um, be flexible. So if that happens again, I apologize, but we'll try to work through it. So, um, I've got I, what I think are some six easy questions for some great prizes. Um, and we will start with, what is the 2020-2021 state aid per capita amount? And you don't have to go all the way. Just give me like the first two would be fine. Oh, Bree, good job. Bree, right away. 0.4299853, which is super exciting. I'm very excited about that. Um, so this is a narration of Peter and the Wolf, and that will go to Miss Bree. Get all my prizes together here. Okay. Um, how many class six libraries are White Pine members? Aaron, correct, zero. We don't have any class six. It's kind of a trick question, sorry. Um, this is a uh, audio book called The Wedding Date that will go to Aaron. And what is the average number of 
directors or your staff even that attend the Tuesday White Pine Zoom meeting. So is it the average number that attend. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Jeanette from Birch Run. Nope, Stephanie came in first with that. Sorry. Stephanie, 17. Sorry, Jeanette. Okay, and you get Alien Superstar, and this is signed by Henry Winkler, so just for you. The Fonz, right? For those of you who are old enough to know what I mean by that. Um, okay, this deals with Library of Michigan staff, and in particular, Shannon. What is her last name? Brie, you already won one, so I'm going to give it to Amy. That's okay. And Amy gets Ferris. This is a, I'm assuming this is signed to, it is, uh, a memoir called Ferris and signed by the author. So that goes to Miss Amy. And how many cooperatives are in Michigan? Not hit it yet. Pam, 11. Good job, Pam. Okay. And Pam, you get a lovely folio here that says White Pine Library Cooperative on it. And then our last question for this lovely tote bag here. Very nice tote bag. Can we start using those in grocery stores again? I don't know. Can you? Okay. Um, what is April 20th, 2021 in library world? April 20th next year. <laughs> Weed in books. Legislative day. Good job, Erin. But Erin, you won already. So, and I just said that that was the right answer. So Erin, I will give you the chance to pick. What did you get? Erin, so Erin, either the tote bag or this, which would you like? Where are you, Erin? Okay, so then I am going to give this to Jeanette because she I called her name out sooner than later before. So okay. All right, you guys. Um, so next week we have Diane Connery, um, and she is a library director in Texas and small, small library. Um, took over. I want to say that the library was going to be closed. Um, she took over. She has a really interesting backstory in um, uh, marketing and she will share with us some of the things that she's done, especially when it comes to digital um, inclusion and hotspots and trying to get internet to um, some of her patrons. One of the things that um, I had seen her on another uh, Zoom call this summer, and one of the things that she had done, which she noticed, was it was on a Sunday, and she went into the library. She hadn't been there that long, and she noticed there were a number of kids sitting out in front of the library, and um, she thought, what's what's going on? And they said, well, we have no internet at home, and so we have to get our homework done, and the library's not open on Sunday. And kids, you know, like most people, we procrastinate. We wait till the 
11th hour before something's due. And so she decided to, you know, there's a need. So she opened up the library on Sunday for Sunday hours. And so there's just some of the little things that she's done and how she's been able to accomplish it. Um, and a huge part of that is with partnerships. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to share that with you and hope you've signed up. I think you have till Friday to sign up if you haven't. And uh, after next week's um, program, the board will be meeting. So uh, any board members on the call right now, I think you, you are aware of that and your board packets will be going out too. So, or the information will be posted. So um, does anybody have any questions, other comments? Um, I hope I, that oh. from St. Charles. I yeah. have a question if everybody doesn't mind. Um, sure. With all of the new uh, Michigan Health Department guidelines or restrictions, are there any fellow libraries out there that are going to go ahead and just open up fully to their normal hours with just the limited occupancy and mask requirements? Or is everybody still running on restricted hours? Uh, Mrs. Stephanie, we have some libraries that are doing regular hours and some libraries that affected this week have increased their number of hours. They're still not their regular hours, but closer. But we still have a few libraries that are really restricted. Okay, we so. increased our hours about a month or uh, at, after Labor Day and we're still really slow. Um, I anticipate going ahead and opening up and letting people use our meeting rooms and stuff with the new guidelines or the new restrictions as far as occupancy, but was wondering what we want to do about hours, operating hours. Thank there's, you. There's some info in the chat in it too. And, um, you know, it's interesting, I was talking to Jeff before uh, you guys all came into the meeting and asked at Ferndale if they were open, um, you know, thinking that more in a, in a city, it, it might be a little bit different, not sure what that, in my mind, that's what I was thinking, but um, he said, no, they're just curbside. And they, um, he said their curbside took a while to take off, but now he said it's just cranking. The, the, the sad thing he said is though the, the folks, and I know you guys all know this too, the folks that normally would come in every day, um, you know, where, where do they go? The folks that really are dependent on the, the library's computers or just a place to go too. So, um, and, and he said they, they really have gotten the most pushback from people who want to um, uh, use, use like the meeting rooms and stuff, especially he said tutors who want a place to, to do that and they were a little upset that they couldn't. That's what I mean the most people want is to start using our rooms again. But I'm concerned about the burden it places on the library as far as cleaning, sanitizing, supplies, staff. You know, am I going to increase hours just to accommodate people to use our rooms? But the staff itself is not avail or you know, the circulation and the library usage is not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Will it come back if we open full hours? I guess kind of what I'm wondering is more people would be apt to come back in then. Yeah, I I I don't know. I, you know it's it's just so hard to know. You know your community best, um, but you know, and you also look at the health department numbers, and I don't know, so many, so many things to think about. Um, but yeah, there's some more info in the chat here too. So, does anybody have anything else or? Well, I appreciate all you guys coming. Thank you so much. And I hope that um, you get a chance to take a drive and look at some of the beautiful colors out there. Oh my gosh, just gorgeous. In, um, in Cass City, just east of town, there's a road called Schwegler Road. 
and that's our tunnel of trees. I mean, it is just, it's a gorgeous, you know, narrow road with just these, this huge canopy of trees. And um, I actually got to drive it yesterday because I met Mimi to grab some something for Mimi and um, just beautiful. So I hope you take the time and just drive around and maybe look at how beautiful the leaves are this year. They really are before that S word might hit us this weekend. <laughs> Sorry. So have a good day, you guys. Um, hope to see you next week. Stay safe.